scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on a path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they didn't have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. If you have ears, hear. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. And as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution rises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of this age and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Here ends the reading. <laughs> well, I gotta tell you, the sower in this parable seeds the ground the way I seed the ground. I was so proud of myself for building a backyard fence for my dogs the first fall I was in my house, last fall, two falls ago, I guess. But come the next day, the wet spring, it quickly became clear to me how muddy it was to have two hounds bounding in from outside several times a day, given that my backyard was almost all weeds. I needed grass. So I visited soil service and with some minimal instruction went about walking through my backyard, scattering handfuls of seeds every few weeks. What do you think was the result? Got some gardeners here, I see. Patchy. It was patchy. <laughs> when it finally came up several weeks later, I wasn't even entirely sure if any of the greenery came from that seed that I laid down or not, given that I'd planted it so early in the season. There seemed to be some grass in some places, but then weeds that continued to grow so much taller and faster than anything resembling grass, and large patches remained of open soil. So a year later, I am still at war with my lawn and my dogs and their feet. A smart, diligent, strategic landscaper would probably have tilled the soil in advance. They might have roped off the area in careful squares and measured the acreage and then made sure they had a perfect amount of seed. They would have done math. They might have prepared the soil with hay and fertilizer once they had de-weeded the space. And they probably would have bought one of those pushcart whirly things that flings the seed out with exacting regularity as you walk, right? You all know what I'm talking about? Is it called a cedar? <laughs> yeah, I could have done all that. I could have taken more responsibility for conditioning the soil and making sure the distribution was executed evenly, but I didn't. And I'm paying the price now. Similarly, if a modern farmer heard this parable today, I imagine they would cringe. Throwing seed out onto the path willy-nilly? That is a terrible way to farm. It's exactly the opposite of our smart and diligent and strategic and technologically infused farming 
of today. Today's farmer would choose the field intentionally for the quality and the drainage, right? They would prep the soil. They would first till it, then they might add fertilizer, maybe even pesticide, and they would analyze it to make sure they have the perfect pH levels before ever injecting the seed. They would have measurements of acreage, of exactly how many rows, of exactly how much length and how much width between each row. And when the time came, the exact perfect time, according to the farmer's almanac, or maybe our great latest in meteorology, they would distribute that seed not willy-nilly by hand, but using machines with the exacting rows and seeds distance just so. But the farmers, and then the farmer's responsibility is far from over. They return time and again to water and fertilize and weed and check on the growth and look for pests and soil conditions to ensure the best harvest possible. Anything else would be a waste of seed and time and energy and resources and could hardly be counted on to become a good crop. The sower in our parable is a terrible farmer. He doesn't do any prep on the soil. He doesn't lay any seed in a strategic manner, and he doesn't follow up to make sure the seed has happy conditions for optimal growth. Could he have pulled all the stones from the rocky soil? Probably not. But he certainly could have weeded the thorns out of the field as the weeds grow. He could have added fertilizer. He could have made sure everything was watered. He just left it for someone else to take responsibility for it. That's not usually the interpretation of the scripture, but as I read this week, I read it this week, it seemed like an interesting metaphor for some of our some aspects of our UCC denomination. Here at Kansas City UCC, we are all but finished with two groups of new members classes, save for the final fun fellowship dinner which is Tuesday. I think we've had a good time getting to know each other. We've had some great theological discussion, a good amount of laughs. And come August 13th, we hope to welcome in six new households into our church family. And we'll all be very excited that day. And while we did a light summary of UCC history and theology and polity, there are four bigger concepts that loom unique in our UCC formation that I thought were worth exploring more broadly because they are relevant to all of us. And in my opinion, to most of the people in this country as we think about who we are and who we want to be. The first was something that I explored the last time I was in this pulpit, how we embrace our motto of united and uniting while valuing diversity of class and race and gender and orientation, as well as liberal and conservative thoughts in our pews and in our wider church. How do we as a denomination manage to walk that narrow path that embraces both ends and judge how much tolerance is good versus when tolerance becomes harmful? Or on the other side, how do we stop ourselves from instituting a litmus test from the progressive side that stifles thought from the conservative side, ideas that might be helpful to us in one way or another? That tension between unity and diversity is a situation brought on by the values of the UCC that we continually work towards a more perfect union while valuing all people as they are. Today I wanted to talk about a second concept, the tension between covenant and autonomy. Now you've all heard me talk about covenant. It's possible that you've heard me talk about covenant to the point that you don't really want to hear me talk about covenant anymore. We are a denomination that holds covenant central. The only binding we have to each other is voluntary through the covenant or promise that we make to each other. In some ways, you can make the argument that covenant is one of the easiest things to enter into. It's simply a promise. But it's also one of the hardest things to do well. Ask any married couple how easy it is to maintain their marriage covenant. You can't give just 30 or 50% of yourself to marriage. You have to give above and beyond that, above and beyond 100% at times in order to make it work. And at the same time, in the UCC, each church has autonomy. There is no one who can tell us how to worship, who to hire, when to let them go, how much money to give away or to collect or to pay, who to include or exclude from church membership or any other decision that we might make as a congregation. As stated in one of our books, the evolution of a UCC style, 
As a church, we maintain that no one outside this congregation has enough experience of this content to prescribe what that congregation ought to do or which leadership it should call. We have autonomy to enter into covenant with our pastor or other staff, to rearrange our worship, to proclaim our politics, to educate our youth without much interference, if any, from our conference, association, or denomination. But that also means that no one is coming to save us. Autonomy is a double-edged sword because it sounds like freedom, but it manifests like responsibility. We are responsible for our own soils, so to speak. We can't blame a bishop. The sower has thrown some seed, but there is no bishop coming in to fertilize our fundraising, to till through our packed assumptions, to help us weed out our problematic behavior, or to nourish new growth. We are responsible for our own soils and healthy growth built on participation, cooperation, encouragement, and understanding. This makes it even more important that we are doing things well at the congregational level, at the association level, at the conference level, and at our synod. As the autonomous unit solely responsible for hiring, firing, fundraising, building management, liturgical traditions, educating our youth, receiving new members, interpreting scripture, and making public commitments about our faith, like being open and affirming, it is up to us. We have the responsibility for forming and executing our own processes, making our own choices, negotiating our own consensus. We are the body of Christ, and we are the church. And in contrast, to some of our secular sources, the federal, state, and local politics that we watch, where we get a front row seat to how easy it is to let someone else do the work and criticize them while they do it. In our church, we aim to do the opposite. We work to achieve the church mission together, drawing together all our talents and resources and ideas and aspirations and finding ways to work together for the good of the whole. And with God's help, we endeavor to value and trust each other and communicate the best way we know how. And last but not least, and we must never forget the importance of this, we work to foster a culture of grace and forgiveness for our leaders and our members when those decision-making processes are challenging or divisive. That is perhaps the sharpest contrast from inside the church to the outside the church, where victory is more important than harmony. We put our faith and hopes in the ideal that we endeavor to do all things, to negotiate all decisions, to solve all our challenges, and to reconcile all conflict in covenantal love. And so we find ourselves back at covenant. What does covenant require? And what are our mutual responsibilities to each other? In the words of one of my favorite theologians, Walter Brueggemann, in his book, The Covenanted Self, covenanting requires maturity to be knit together in love. It's a great phrase, isn't it? Covenanting requires maturity to be knit together in love. Part of our commitment is to be mutually respondent to each other's needs, meaning here in our congregation, we respond to the joys and celebrations of our lives, as well as the heartaches and the trials of our neighbors in the pews and in our community. We call and we send cards and we organize meal trains and we offer prayers. We help carry out each other's goals by planning fish fries, brainstorming centennial celebrations, painting doors, and building shelving units for our closets. We work side by side to support, to listen, to acknowledge, and to model the unconditional forgiving love of God. The covenantal relationship is also how we build trust, not only in our congregation, but in the wider world. For example, we here in Kansas City UCC have a covenantal relationship with all the other UCC congregations in the Western Association. But how do we know that we can abide by the decisions made in those other congregations that we are in covenant with? 
One way we do that is by setting guidelines and boundaries for clergy and congregations. It is the association that delineates the policies and procedures to make sure, for example, that we are screening clergy candidates and pro to protect the most vulnerable from abuse. There are many churches out there that spring up here and there by themselves with one charismatic leader and a few people that feel inspired. There are also non-denominational churches that pride themselves on the, being efficient and nimble and not having to deal with the bureaucracy of the wider denomination. But with both of those situations, it begs the question, to whom is the congregation or the clergy accountable to? What is preventing that congregation from mismanagement, from embezzlement of funds, from misconduct or sexual abuse? In this day and age, we know all too well the generational trauma incurred when clergy behavior goes unchecked. Indeed, it seems as if the entire religious establishment, all church, is now held responsible for the misdeeds of anyone in the collar over the last several decades. We know that we have to set thresholds and boundaries on the behavior allowed in the UCC because of our shared reputation and our shared responsibility of being church in the world. In the United Church of Christ, we work to be a covenantal network of autonomous bodies who prize both freedom and accountability, the two always intertwined and always to be negotiated. And so it is our commitment to the covenant through bodies like our association, the Committee on Ministry, the conference, where we strive to determine the boundaries for our congregational relationships to establish the standards and expectations for clergy, to offer education and training, and to take action when violations occur, to hold people or congregations accountable, in order to protect the most vulnerable people in our congregations. In that way, we as churches also surrender a portion of our autonomy in service of the covenant. We agree to hold ourselves accountable to each other and submit to the authority of the Committee on Ministry. But, and this is a critical but, the system that we have in our denominational covenants only functions when there are enough volunteers willing to occupy the committees and boards and associations that oversee our covenantal commitments as a wider church. I wanted to talk about the tension between covenant and authority as part of our new members' classes to give us something to think about and the wider church. But it, as I was thinking about this, this week I was in two different meetings. I was, I'm on the personnel committee for our conference minister, Mary Nelson, and I was in a Western Association cluster meeting, both of which affected by this lack of participation. In Mary's review, one of her three major goals she was unable to complete because we haven't found enough people to serve on the Missouri Valley Advisory Committee, Missouri Valley being the camp, I think, that we use in the UCC. And in the Western Association, they keep trying over and over again to get people engaged from our churches. We are supposed to have one clergy and two lay people per every meeting, but we barely make quorum on a regular basis. We are in a moment right now of disengagement, I think, from the pandemic, perhaps from the explosion of technology and having more relationships on our phone than we have in real life. Or maybe it's from fatigue in general with organized th institutions like the church. But the UCC does not operate without engagement. So as I give you this sermon, I say this with the plea of, if anyone's willing to serve, please talk to me, because we need more volunteers. Ibu Patel is a uh, a man, a Muslim in Chicago who was connected with my seminary, so I, I knew about him in Chicago, and he runs an interfaith or service organization that does incredible work with youth. And he was in the New York Times recently in an interview. He said a healthy sector, talking about the, the, the purpose and the importance of organized religion in the, use, in the United States in general. And he said, a healthy sector cannot have 100 arsonists for every architect. He was talking about how many people are ready to walk away from organized religion without thinking about all the benefits that we provide, all the good that has gone into the world because of organized religion. He says, you can't have a critical mass of people 
going around basically telling other people that they're doing wrong and constantly existing, constantly undermining existing institutions if better ones aren't replacing them. In popular discourse, there's a model of social change that seems to say that if I tell you how much I hate you and totally delegitimize you, then something better will rise up from the ground organically. But that's not how it works. He goes on to say, this is my understanding of religion and pluralism and social change. If you tell an inspiring story, people will want to move in that direction. If you only tell a terrible story about America or its religious institutions, then people will think that terribleness is inevitable. I think we spend a lot of time telling terrible stories in our media, in our own frustration with the way things go. We tend to spend a lot of time absorbing terrible stories. But the story of the UCC is a story of hope. It's a story of ideals and noble dreams and aspirations of people coming together and working across barriers, living within the tension of two polarities, engaging and participating rather than sitting back and pointing fingers. And when we join in the operations of the United Church of Christ in whatever capacity, whether you join a church, you join a larger cluster, you join diaconate, you join the uh, planning committee for the Kansas City General, General Synod in 2025, you help tell the inspiring story of who we are as a church and who we could be as a country. Because like the parable, there is no outside authority coming to save us or coming to fix us to tend to our soils or to weed out our problems. In the UCC, we are responsible for our own soils at every level. And we can't blame the bishop, rather we are the bishop. We are the ones responsible for nurturing our own healthy growth here and in the wider conference. It's described well in one of the brochures that you'll find in the, um, on the wall over there, a brochure that says who we are and what we believe under the heading Responsible Freedom. As individual members of the body of Christ, we are free to believe and act in accordance with our perception of God's will for our lives. But we are called to live in a loving, covenantal relationship with one another, gathering in communities of faith, congregations of believers, local churches. Each congregation or local church is free to act in accordance with the collective decision of its members, guided by the working of the Spirit in light of the scriptures. But it is also called to live in a covenantal relationship with other congregations for the sharing of insights and for cooperative action under the authority of Christ. We, perhaps more than many other denominations, are called to participate in the body of Christ through our covenantal structure. While we have freedom from authority, in our denomination, autonomy does not mean apathy. We are called to be sowers, growers, and tenders in the garden of God's kingdom, creating the best conditions for the seed as it falls on our soils. May we all have a greener thumb than I do. Amen. <laughs>